Yeah, I pretty much stopped the drink at the age of eight. By the way, I I started broadcasting, so I just wanted to catch your... Of course you did. (laughs) All right. Welcome, everybody, to our first Juju Office Hours of 2016. I got everybody here. We're really excited. We got so much things to cover. I can't even... I can't, I have I actually have an agenda of things that we have to cover, and I'm gonna try to keep the, the time on each subject as as concise as possible because we got a ton, ton of news. So first of all, we just got back from Belgium, lovely Belgium, as part of the config management camp. Um, we co-hosted our second Juju Charmer Summit. We had check this out, Antonio. Over 700 people attended config management camp. At least 100 people stopped by the Juju room. And signed in. That's just people that signed in. Um, so over 100 people representing over 44 organizations. So that was really awesome. Um, so we we are really happy to see so many people show up. Uh, so that was really good. And we covered tons of talks. And we've got them all on video. We got all the slides. Those are all published on the insights.ubuntu.com blog. And we got nicer videos that we're currently working on that are slides. And the video integrated in a nice, so you can follow along and do kind of the more instructional thing. Um, and those will be published over the next, the first one is ready, and uh, the other ones are currently in editing. However, Bart Smith in the audience was kind enough to record all the sessions he were in. So we actually got a decent amount of videos already out there, and I got the slides from everybody. So uh, with that, why don't we just go around the room, everyone, introduce themselves. Hi, Gilbert. I don't think we, have we met before? Uh, I don't think so, not in person anyway. Oh, okay. Well, I guess you should probably kick it off. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm Gilbert Standen. Uh, I'm uh, kind of getting involved in OpenStack. I'm, I'm trying to do some things with Oracle on OpenStack, which is kind of an odd combo, but that's what I'm working on. Okay, awesome. Uh, let's go around the room real quick. Antonio. Yeah, hello. I'm Antonio. I work uh, on Juju Ecosystem Team work on trying to figure out how to model big data solutions, uh, OpenStack solutions, container solutions with uh, some of the fine gentlemen here. Chuck? Uh, I think Chuck had a drop because his Hangout wasn't working on his uh, proprietary system. I see. It's, it's, it's frozen. Kev? First of all, a nice jab, Marco. His proprietary operating system caught him slipping. So I'm Kevin Monroe. I'm on the uh, uh, big data, uh, or the Juju big data team in the Juju ecosystem. We have had a heck of a year so far um, in terms of conferences and meeting lots of great people in the last two months. Um, it's still so early in the year, but we've got such a great um, direction to go that I'm just really pumped for um, uh, not only talking to you guys and telling folks what we're up to, but also hearing what you're doing and, and hopefully incorporating some of your best practices. Uh, into into the offerings that we're making. So, again, I'm Kevin. I'm excited for the year. Next. Marco. Uh, Marco Cheffi. Um, I'm part of the Juju Charm community team. I'm just uh, super excited about people writing charms in general and using Juju. Matt. Yep, my name is Matt Brujek. Um, I work on the ecosystems team uh, focusing on the containers like Docker and Kubernetes. Uh, stuff. Um, I've met Gilbert in person at uh, at Scale um, in 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 Pasadena. So um, welcome. Nice to see you again. Um, just looking forward to answering questions if there's any. Randall. Hey, I'm Randall Ross. I'm one of the Ubuntu community managers, and uh, my interest area is making sure that Juju and Open Power work fantastically together. Awesome. And with that, Matt, does your shirt want to introduce itself? I think it should be louder. <laughs> it literally is like burning a hole in me, but that's okay. That's okay. So uh, what do we want to talk about first? Gilbert, do you have any burning questions? I, I feel like we should continue maybe maybe the vibe that you guys got at scale, or do we want to go over the stuff we went through in well. – the summit because if we there's there's lots there's lots of things. Marco yeah. seems like he wants to talk about something. Actually, I want to thank you, Gilbert. You left a fantastic comment on a really old blog post of mine, which helped correct a lot of the things that are old in it now. But um, I was excited to see you get OpenStack running on your on your two your two machine uh, cluster. If you want to talk briefly about that. 
Okay, uh, yeah, I just had to unmute there. I'm, I'm actually in a room here where there's a lot of servers running, so I had it uh, muted so that it doesn't... Uh... Anyway, can you hear me okay? Yeah, it sounds great. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so just following up with what Matt said, I, yeah, I met uh, Matt and some of the Canonical team at uh, Scale 14X, where I went as an exhibitor. Um, just briefly, I have some software I wrote. It's it's all in Bash. It's scripts, but it's called Orubuntu LXC. It's a way to run Oracle 12C ASM Plex clusters with grid naming service natively on Ubuntu with no hypervisor. Uh, it uses LXC containers. It's it's really just a desktop tool at this point, but that's why I branched out into Marco's uh, guide on how to build your own home OpenStack because I, I want to sort of port the solution over to an actual OpenStack uh, LXC deployment uh, type model. And so the, the idea for the first one is to take Oracle XE, which is an RPM, and deploy it on Ubuntu OpenStack uh, in LXC containers, uh, or natively, but probably LXC containers is simpler. Um, and uh, just as far as this uh, this OpenStack I've built here, um, I had access to some old Dell PowerEdge 2850s. These are really old. They use Ultra 320 SCSI drives. Um, pretty old technology, but uh, if you upgrade the IPMI to the latest rev, which is the 1.83A10, it, it works okay with uh, MOS 1.9. So uh, I was able to, to build my, uh, my setup. Um, I did have a question, actually. Uh, about that um, after following up on these other topics that uh, Marco and, and uh, um, had mentioned. Um, when I, is, is there any, uh, is, this is a really dumb newbie question, but when you shut down your OpenStack, is there any kind of procedure you need to go through or, or are they supposed to be pretty robust? I mean, like say you lose power and you just have to reboot all the metal. Um, can you expect problems, or is it pretty robust? And is there and is there a preferable shutdown procedure that you should use if you do shut it down? That's a that's a really that's a really good question. I don't know. I don't. None of the OpenStack charmers are here to, to answer this one directly. Um, I'm gonna I'll go, go find. I'll go find one, but that just yeah. that whole idea frightens me. I'm gonna say most <laughs> people don't turn their, their clouds off in production, so I don't think it's a question <laughs> many people have asked. Um, right. There shouldn't be a problem with turning off. I think if you were to shut down an OpenStack cloud, you want to bring up the supporting services first, so the databases, then things like Keystone, and then the other services. Uh, that way, when they start trying to make API calls, uh, like Nova and Cinder and stuff, will be able to find a home. But I don't think that it's, it should really be detrimental, per se, other than your cloud won't exist. Um, I think the charms are robust enough that they'll respond appropriately start figuring out things as they come back online. They should. So I'll try to put some, some color on that, too. They, so in an ideal world, they'll come back up, right? But in a non-ideal world, um, one of the things that we wanted to put into the charms was a thing called maintenance mode. And so if you know, so the hard part about it, to, the hard part about it is, like, if you lose power to your DC, man, that's a, that's a hard thing to see how, what's going to happen when stuff comes back up. It's, it's a yeah. non-determined type of thing because you don't know what state things were in. When that's, a, like that. that's just a bad day. Right yeah, that's just that. a bad day. At that point, you have to see how services individually probably are coming up. Your juju status will be able to hopefully do that and maintenance. And your know, status will be able to try, try, try to tell you there. But if you do know your machines are going to go down and you want to schedule maintenance, there are a new feature in the charms, um, the OpenStack set of charms um, called maintenance mode. And you can be able to start going through those, the juju action, to be able to say, hey, it's maintenance mode, you know, respond to the respond correctly for the given service and be able to take the appropriate action on it. And then you can take it down for maintenance or try to upgrade or however you want to be able to do. But that'll that'll at least stop services in a graceful way. That's a kind of a nice feature in the terms of solves. That's the juju action that could take it there. So if you're trying to explore that and you're trying to take it down gracefully, that's the that's the way I at least take a look at it initially and do some research there is on maintenance mode. If there's questions on that, just reply on the list or an IRST and we can get some more information on that. But as long as you're looking at our charm releases, which we try to do every three months, if folks don't know, they align with the Ubuntu cycles. Um, you should see that in the 1601 release. And I think the maintenance mode was also in the 1510 charm release. So at least for that, that's what I would, I would direct you towards there and take a look at that and see what, see what questions you may have. 
Yeah, no, that's great. Um, the reason I ask partly is because when I the reboot the first time, everything was fine, but on the second reboot, uh, there were some uh, like disk type errors, and I I think it's just uh, something with the the hardware, you know, older equipment. Um, no. It's actually a failing disk, but I wasn't sure if it was because I had read some post uh, that was something about uh, issues you can run into if the OpenStack hardware just suddenly loses power. So, hmm. yeah. yeah and, like, ideally, you'd be in an HA environment that if something went bad, you would just put it in maintenance mode that effectively takes it out and then either repair it or replace it with something and then put that back in. Yeah. How yeah. I understand so how I understand the workflow to be. Right. It's, maintenance mode isn't going to kill the machine or power it off, but it's at least going to be able to say, "Hey, I'm taking it." Yeah, it's like hey, I'm no longer responsible for anything. Give me I'll anymore. be over here. Right. Don't give me exactly. any more work. Right, you know, right. So if you needed to take maintenance on that machine, if you were load balancing behind it, you could, you know, keep your services up, take them out of maintenance mode, do whatever you need to do. Oh. Well, that's good. I think um, after seeing what James Page did this last week, Gilbert, I think you'd be interested on the running do or sorry, running OpenStack on one machine, which is a little bit cleaner than Marco's old way all in LexD containers, and he was running it pretty awesome on a ThinkPad X230, which is what I got here. Um, there was a lot of heat coming out of the side, but it was working uh, well and performant enough on his double SSDs for it to be a decent workflow environment. So he was standing it up, testing, committing, tearing it down, resetting it back up, and just, just regularly sitting there. So I think if you have a decent server class hardware, that that would be... Yep. Really, the way to go. Unfortunately, I don't think all his commits on his laptop have made it to the charms just yet. Marco, I think you might have more information about that. This is what I was looking for when he brought when Gilbert was talking about LexDs and single machines. Is yeah. If if you haven't seen this on the mail list, Gilbert, take read through that. So there's mm -hmm. some stuff that's out there on GitHub underneath there, but this is a nice step through. You need a Xenial machine to be able to do it. If you have yeah. ZFS underneath it, it's even better. But this kind of steps you through it. And this is the idea here is a machine multi-containers on the Xenial, um, setting up a full open stack. So it's a multi-node open stack on a machine, and each one of your services are contained within a Lex, the environment itself. So really powerful for developers. I mean, this is meaning that, like, like, like uh, George said, on a laptop, you can be able to actually have a multi-node deployment on there. Yeah. So I could dev and actually look at how networking looks between services on a multi-node environment and see what that looks like rather than just trying to do it on one single node. You know, actually try to emulate what an actual cloud would look like in a multi-node environment on your laptop, you know, which is pretty powerful, I think. So. And where do I, where do I uh, get that information about that? I'm sorry, I'll post it in IRC is a better place. Um, I post it here on the sidebar, oh, but I'll post it yeah. in IRC. Yeah, it's on the Juju mailing list. The subject is Juju 2.0, local Lexi provider workflows are awesome. I'm actually yeah. debating. I see his little bundle there. I'm debating just doing it. Now, <laughs> what's your IRC? What's your IRC, Nick Gilbert? Are you are you in Pound Juju? I probably am not. Uh, okay. Well, I posted it here in the Google sidebar. Uh, okay. Sidebar. Google has a little chat thing. That's a little blue icon. If you hit in the left hand corner, um, yep. You can click on that link that I said there. It's from list.ubuntu.com. Got it. And then that's on the Juju mailing list. If folks aren't aware, aware, you know, join join the Juju mailing list. That's a good one to keep keep caught up on the conversations that are happening. Okay. For sure. Awesome. All right. So moving on, any any other questions in this line, or do we want to start things talking things about Juju 2.0 and uh, what we covered in the in the Charmer Summit? I think maybe we could just have a quick summary of what you guys thought of Config Management Camp and the Charmer Summit. Um, they, this is the very first summit where, or event actually, where we just straight up told everybody, here's Juju 2.0 Alpha, there's a stable release out, but all this awesome stuff is in 2.0, so we kind of leaned forward and kind of taught everyone, uh, kind of prepped them for the future as opposed to getting them up and running with the old way of doing Juju things. So um, for everyone that was at the summit, though, a new Alpha version of Juju dropped like yesterday. Yep, and I've got it right here. 
Um, and it has a lot of the changes that were talked about at the summit. And then for those who weren't at the summit, a lot of cool stuff is shifting in 2.0, and it's all landing in this development version. Um, out the last alpha was today, and I think the next one's going to be a beta in a week or two, which will have even more awesome features. I think, oh, yeah, good. George's going to show us. Um, but this involves you. a lot of hand and stuff. So uh, for those of you who are using Juju, uh, it may be worthwhile poking around when one of these in a container or something just to get a, a look at what the new world will look like. Yeah, so I was thinking maybe, Marco, I've got the latest beta. I've got something bootstrapped. If you want to uh, walk... Do we? Do you guys want to see me deploy something, or you want to see the new? Are you, uh, doing, are you on Lexi on your machine right now? I'm Lexi on my machine with okay. ZFS. It's deploy really a, fast. Sure. Is it bootstrapped. It is bootstrapped. So I think the first things first is when. Why don't you walk through people creating a model first? Yeah, yeah, but let's deploy That's, the GUI first. So oh, you bootstrap. Sure, sure. The show's Juju status real quickly. So George just did a bootstrap. Hold on. All right. So I'm gonna mute myself because I'm typing on a mechanical keyboard. You just tell me what to type, okay? Yeah, yeah, make sure you're presenting yourself, though. I don't want to everyone see my face while you're typing. I'm going to assume he's presenting. Um, yeah, so George ran a bootstrap. So run Juju status now. We'll see what you got going on. And so he's got, just like you normally would see, uh, the status output's a little different. This is the formula tabular format. This is going to be the default format by default. If you want the old way, you can just type Juju status format YAML, but you've got... Yeah, George, share your share your screen, please. <laughs> no one wants to see my face. I'm I've I've clicked on me. They shouldn't see you. Okay. You guys should see Marco. I hope so. Or you I guys mean, should see my. If this recording comes down, it's just my freaking face. All right. Kevin, what? Can you go to Ubuntu on air and check the YouTube screen? Make sure that we're just seeing my screen. Here's here's the old one, but it yeah, should yeah. be working. So that's. That's the, that's the YAML output, but that's for machines, and occasionally humans can read it. So you've got a bootstrap node. You've got that controller node is what we're calling it now. It's a controller, um, and it's node zero, just like we did before. So go ahead and deploy the GUI. Um, so this is what you normally would experience doing Juju. You've got um, machines allocated. Juju sets up services based on charms. Hit enter. But what's great about this now is Juju gets the ability, in a controller, you can set up multiple models. Um, so what I'm going to have George do is create a new model for us. It's basically, think of this as like a blank canvas in the Juju GUI that you can use, but it's super fast in that you don't have to do a controller creation every single time. So, uh, George, why don't you create us a model? Quick question while George is creating the model. When you did Juju deploy the GUI, what model did that deploy it into? Right, so by default, every controller that you create gets a default administrative model. So that's kind of like where you put the GUI and other administrative bits that you want to have access to. Mm. So George ran Juju Create Model Office Hours Demo, and if he runs Juju Status now, he'll get instant feedback. He didn't go through that process of creating a machine, setting up and everything, and there's no machines. There's no units, no machines, nothing. Uh, but he can start deploying things now, so you can do something like Juju Deploy, SQL Analytics, or whatever the a real-time syslog analytics bundle, the big data bundle. Um, and so what this will do, and it becomes a lot more apparent when we get the GUI up and running, is yeah. that these are all compartmentalized deployments sharing that same central controller. And what's great is we can create different user accounts for the controller, and then we can say, this user gets access to this model, this user gets access to these models, um, and all these bits. Another thing he's doing is deploying a bundle from the store right now using Juju Deploy. No more deployer, no more quick start. Uh, it's all very simple and straightforward. So he's got big data rolling up in this bundle. He can switch back to the default one, Juju Switch Lex D, or List Models is a good way to go. So he's got the Lex D, which is that default uh, model that was created when he created the controller. So if you switch back to Lex D, we'll see if the Juju GUI's up. Oh, not yet. Still allocating. Okay. Well, as soon as this comes up, then uh, we'll be able to go to the GUI. And in the GUI, you can select the drop-down where you can create additional models in the GUI or switch between ones that you have access to on a controller. So it's very uh, it's very nice as far as the user experiences. One interesting thing I just saw you do there is um, when George did Juju Deploy, so he did Bootstrap, he did Deploy GUI, that, that GUI went automatically into the administrator one, LexD, 
but then he said create controller office hours demo and then it did a deploy of a bundle it looks oh, no, like nope, I did not create a controller I created a model I'm sorry model, created, a model. Controller. created yep. a model and then when you did the model um, it looks like it automatically did a switch to you after creating the model so yes. it looks like when you do when you create a model it'll actually switch you to the model without having to say did you switch model or did you list so after right. you after you create a model the next under action you may have not seen is it switched from the admin model right over to the, yeah. uh, the office hours model the new model he created Yeah, so it is um, it is quite an awesome bit of work that the core team has been doing to make this possible. Um, it totally changes uh, a lot of the workflow stuff that's been present before. Uh, it makes it much faster to rev. So if you want to test out something, you don't have to wait a few minutes for a controller to come up through a bootstrap process. You can just say, I've got one controller running in a cloud. Um, I can now go and create multiple different environments or models off of that. Uh, so it makes it much faster to dev and rev. I know that a lot of times on the charm team, especially when we have to do um, testing of different charms for review process, we have to bootstrap a new environment every single time. This makes that a much faster iterative process. Uh, so it's really cool something coming down. Um, George, is that GUI ready yet? Hey, before you switch off of... Uh... Off of that status screen, George, I noticed a, a set of columns there that I hadn't seen before. That's the relations that you're seeing in between services there? That's new for 2.0 Alpha 2? Yeah, that's new in the tabular format output. So um, right. additional details will be popping in. One thing that was uh, clear feedback from people is it wasn't clear what the relations were in the tabular output, while in the YAML output you could derive all that stuff. Um, yeah. So now if you scroll up a little bit more, uh, or make the screen really hard to see, you'll see there's uh, the services, the relations between those services, and then yeah. finally the units and the machines. Um, the idea is to prioritize the information above the fold, essentially, so the services, then relations, and units, but this isn't final design. Is there may still be some iterations done to this based on feedback during the alpha and beta stages. That's cool. Um, what else is awesome? That There's a lot of stuff that's awesome in this release. Um, I could probably go through the release notes real quickly while we wait for this to spin up. Hey, George, do you want to just kill yeah, this Juju GUI and deploy 2.0? Be a little quicker. Yeah, okay. Um, in the meantime, there's a couple of things that came out in this release that I want to highlight. Um, and I know that the Moonstone team, wherever they are, have a cool demo as well. They may be joining us, hopefully, in this office hours. Uh... Hmm. Where are the release notes? So I can hit the notable changes. I have those up if you like, Mark. Oh, yeah, go for it, Antonio. Yeah, so notable changes. They got the terminology, command name changes, new Juju home directory, multi node support for active uh, by default. That's the default now. Um, native support for charms and bundles. So deploy is just native in there. Multi-series charms. Uh, that's a really interesting one is that in your charm metadata you can say which versions of a given OS you support. And so you can't say you support multiple OSs, but for example, for like Ubuntu, you can say you can support Trusty, Precise, and Xenial. Or if you're on CentOS, you can support those ones. In CentOS, I think what Fedora, what's the latest ones we have out there? Fedora 11, 12 out there? So you can support those. So within a given OS, you can list the actual um, version of that OS you support. Um, improved local charm development, and so I believe that's what the Lex D support, being able to do some of those bits, so I'll have to dig into a little bit more. Marco, do you know what the improved local charm development is there, that line item? I do, um, I do, I do. Oh, Kevin, yeah. shoot. It's, uh, I, at least I think I do, it's the, uh, you don't have to have a directory repository anymore, so you don't have to have charm slash series slash whatever. You uh -huh. can say, here's my charm. Bam. My local charm deploy from there. Is that deploy a, period, basically. Is that assuming that the charm has a metadata updated to have multi-series? Uh, I believe that is one of the requirements. Then you can add a minus minus series flag to choose which series in that list you want to deploy it to. Otherwise, it'll default to the first series listed. So if you have it listing support for trusty, zenial, and precise, deploying it without specifying a series gets you trusty. 
Uh, or you could optionally say, put this on Xenial or put this on Precise. So um, no more tedious directory structures of charm, series name, and having a bunch of copies of the charm uh, moved around to support multi-series. It just lives in the charm now as one as one option. Yeah. And correction there, I, I had to on my CentOS. CentOS, Windows, Server, and Ubuntu are the supported OSs, and underneath there you can say which series you support for those. And that's for deploying charms, not necessarily for running Juju itself. I think Juju, Juju can run on that, anything. Yeah. Linux, Windows, OS X, whatever. Oh, that's awesome on the multi-series charms and that directory should just say, hey, here's my, I'm, de I'm, I'm developing from here and I just want to, bam, deploy it from there, which is really cool. Looking forward to that one. Uh, so let's see local providers no longer available. So they've switched any local provider that you're going to run is always going to be a LexD. It's going to shoot up LexD. It's going to put LexD containers on your system. So that's notable in there. Microsoft Azure Resource Manager provider. So lots of changes in Microsoft. They wrote a, Azure basically wrote a new API to be able to manage the resources, specifically storage and compute. Um, and so that was released out there. It had a lot of, fixed a lot of things and made things a lot better. But um, with the new Juju 2.0 and the provider for Azure, they are now using that new API. Um, yeah, wait, before you continue, Antonio, yeah. I want to expand on that for just a yeah, second. That's absolutely. really important for Azure deployments that uh, use constraints. So in big data, we often have a, a certain nodes need to have a different memory constraint or different CPU constraint. And we were finding with the old um, uh, resource manager for Azure, it was very difficult to, let's say, bootstrap an environment with an A1 instance type. Then when you go and you try to deploy a service with like a D2 instance type, right, a different type of machine, if it's not in that, um, you, would, you would oftentimes find yourself not able to deploy a certain service had you bootstrapped in one particular way. Um, and so this, this, uh, this new resource manager API has, has taken care of a lot of those um, paper cuts for us. So uh, at least on the big data side, we're really happy to see this in, in uh, A2 because of um, the fact that we have a lot of different constraints for the types of services that we're deployed. Yeah, the, and I posted the links to the, the release notes uh, over there in Pound Juju if other folks are watching the live stream and want to see what I'm see what I'm referencing if they didn't see that on the mailing list themselves. Uh, bootstrap constraints series. And so this has been able to say I want a default series for my bootstrap and all my other series. And I guess that could be a series within a given OS. Is that does anyone know more about that one? Yeah, so series is always gonna be a very a very granular representation of an operating system. So a series would be something like CentOS 7 or Win 2012 HVR2 instead of saying like Windows or CentOS or Ubuntu or Trusty and Xenial in the case of a, a series. So it's a specific release of an operating system. Um, but you could just bootstrap, say I want to bootstrap Xenial, but, and, but then I could do deploy Trusty somewhere else and stuff. So before it kind of always just grabbed the latest LTS of uh, Ubuntu for the, for the bootstrap node. Gotcha, and that's dash dash constraints, service constraints. And uh, Curtis and the Juju core team did a great job of not only having the highlights at the very top of the, the mail, but then if you scroll down, you can also see you know, what the description of that particular feature they have out with bootstrap, bootstrap constraints here. So for example, Juju bootstrap, dash dash bootstrap, tax series, trusty, we'll give you that. Um, Maz spaces, so new discover, so spaces are automatically discovered if you're looking at Maz 1.9 plus. That's available for binding on deployment, and so roughly what spaces are? Are they trying to be able? This to is a this is a big a big jump for the networking stuff in Juju. Um, we're piloting all the networking features with Juju and Maz first, um, since it's easier for us to kind of play around with both the products. But the stuff that's being evolved with the Maz space is the stuff that'll eventually for Juju will land with Juju managing network for AWS or Azure or GC or any of those others that provide, or OpenStack, that provide that networking um, interface. So initial support for Juju network modeling is landed in this alpha for those running MAS, like you, Gilbert, run, those running MAS 1.9 or higher. I know that a lot of the charms, or some charms are starting to move to take, a, take uh, make use of the new networking features in Juju. Um, I don't have a list of the ones that have that support yet, though. But I think, aren't the OpenStack charms moving towards networking support where it makes sense? Yeah. There's a couple yeah. things on the peer relation that need to be a little better there, but the specific point here is the iteration in there is now spaces are automatically discovered from Maz on yeah. Bootstrap. 
which is, a, is another great milestone to see there. And then we'll continue to do that in some of the iterations in the OpenStack Charms. If you want those, are in dash next is what we're trying to do. Still some features that need to be there for the GA of 2.0 to make that a full story. Cool. Juju logging improvements. So logs from Juju machines and unit agents are now streamed to Juju controllers over the API um, in reference to using log, uh, RSS log B. And so all those, all those logs from the Juju machines are now going to Juju controllers over the Juju API instead of RSS logs. So you may notice some difference in logging there if you're looking for them. Um, API logging with macaroon. So that's like I think Marco said earlier, you can be able to, in this controller model, you can be able to have different users log in. Um, so that's available on the API. Unit agent information. So they made some information to the work cycle, life cycle improvement on the unit agent and the release, um, the resource dependencies, API connections, locks, et cetera, shared amongst concurrent workers that connect the agents are now well-defined, modeled, and coordinated by the engine. Um, so as from a charm author perspective, I don't think we'll see these as far as having a more robust agent be out there to communicate with your bootstrap central node. I guess it's more of our controller node. That's what we have here. Cool. Um, that, so I think George has got cool. some of the demo bits ready now that uh, we are ready. deploying stuff. Uh, George, what you got cooking? Yeah, so what happened here is I, I checked it out and that machine just got stuck at pending. So the command I did to fix that is, since it's a cloud that might happen, this is all alpha stuff, is I did juju deploy the juju GUI, dash dash two node zero, which we know is working, and then we call it juju GUI demo because we can't just call it juju GUI. Um, and then that deployed, so I'll go ahead and stop broadcasting that and start broadcasting the actual GUI itself which is, sorry about this for a second. Can you guys see that? Yep. Okay, and the username is admin, right? Yeah, the default username that you created when you do a, do a creation of controller is admin. Huh, okay. Well, I pasted in the password and it's not logging in, so we made some progress. Come back to me later. What? <laughs> Dude, I don't. It won't log in. I don't know. I gotta. I gotta reset the password or something. Hold on. I think I have a running controller somewhere. <laughs> this is the joys of alpha software. Um, yeah, I, I did. A, I did a. I did one on on Amazon. Give me a second to find it. Um, I mean, it told me where to get the password. I typed in the command. I got the password. I put an admin. It just is not logging in. I don't. Is is that a change from previous? Because I thought it was user dash admin. No, that's for the API login. Um, it oh, is okay. just admin for the GUI though. Ah. Uh, I think I have an environment. This is running on my thing, so it doesn't matter if you see the password or not. Well, the best way to do this, I would recommend, is for other folks who are watching, is always go to the README. And so the README, there's there's nothing about the GUI. It still should be deploying. So you notice that George is running an alpha version of Juju Core, which is yet to be released. But when he deployed, he just deployed the Juju GUI, which is looking for the current recommended one in the Charm Store. And so that should tell you where to get your where you get your password from. And that is looking through the README. Yeah, the, the GUI itself on the screen will tell you, type this command to get your password and everything. And I type Juju API info. It gives me all that. OK. Um, it's just not logging in. I don't know why. Does your environment channel have an admin secret? No, it, does, it doesn't do an admin secret anymore. Just oh, Juju you know API what? info, password, password. Uh, I remember seeing a bug about this in the GUI. Oh no! I remember seeing this. This is a working alpha too. All right, this is a sad. Anyway, I'm uh, gonna close that tab and go back to the CLI like a professional. I know the <laughs> GUI. It's beautiful, but let's face it, a lot of the heavy lifting that happens in the CLI. Hold on, I, I got cooler shit stuff to show you guys other than the busted GUI though. However, if we do go back, remember we can list all our models, right? Let's switch back to the office hours demo. So we can always switch. Sorry. Something that the 
is a really nice little feature that landed in between 2.0 is everything has tab completion now. So before you used to have, we only had tab completion for like the first command, and then you were kind of on your own. Now you can just do um, hit tab whenever you want, and and that will work. Powers demo. Okay, so we're here now. If we do juju status, we'll actually see something working, which is uh, Kevin's bundle. So those were all the services over here. Now we're starting to see a whole bunch of readies, right? The compute slaves are ready. And now we're just waiting for a few more things to finish up. And then that big data bundle should be ready here in about another, I don't know, three, four minutes maybe. How long has it been since I since I hit enter? Not that much. I don't know, maybe 10, 15 minutes? 10 yeah, minutes? yeah, it should be almost ready. Keep in mind, if you look at... I load a six, but the machine is just responsive. <laughs> My machine is responsive. You literally, I, I am doing the Hangout. Like in the past, I would have had to buy a separate machine just to do my Hangouts and my everyday work, and I would have to SSH somewhere to actually deploy something. Now I'll, I'm switching my virtual desktops. Everything is really responsive, so that is really, really exciting to me. Okay, continue, Marco. Sorry. Oh, I'm... What else do you want to show? I mean, well, I, so I see somebody has a working GUI. I think that's Kevin. Why don't we cut over to him? Kevin must must not be running the late. Oh, he's running the sandbox. Yeah. But if you click on the sandbox up there, oh, commit this actually first. I don't know if this works in the demo mode or not, but the drop down where the sandbox is, the top left. Yeah. So this is where you'd be able to list and create new. Models, new models, but I don't think it works in the sandbox. Yeah. But and did you see that's that that still has the old terminology too? That's what we used to call environments. If if you on the little text box there, yeah, that should be model name. So that's that's the terminology we're using now. Just as like a heads up. Cool. Um, those are the kind of the, the major thing is that the models by default, which landed in this last release yesterday, which is exciting to, to play with. Um, there's a bunch of, do we have any major charm releases from the big data team? Or the, I know we had um, end of the month was the OpenStack did their mid-cycle charm release, which was exciting. <laughs> Lots of cool things landed there. Um, didn't, uh, Kevin, didn't you big data guys have a recently? No? Okay. Um, oh, well, let's see. Chuck was mentioning that um, during the summit, if you were at his talk, he talked about Ansible support for charms as one of the different ways to consume existing um, configuration management tools. Looks like he's wrapped up the first iteration of that. Uh, so there's a charms that Ansible module in a way that you can consume existing playbooks inside of charms as a layer. So writing a couple of nice explicit uh, methods that kind of wrap the Juju functionality and push it into a playbook. Uh, while this one's Ansible support, that this theoretically could work for things like Puppet or Chef or any of the tools out there, salt stack, etc. So uh, we're excited to see this as one of the patterns emerging, and we're looking forward to people who have those expertise to kind of help bridge the gap between I have existing tools and leveraging that knowledge and that expertise of that operational bits of setting up software with these scripts and bridging them into Juju Charms. And we've got... Actually, if, if you go on insights.ubuntu.com in the Charmer Summit... Uh, Chuck's talk was one of the ones that we have a video for right away. And if you're on the Juju mailing list, I've, I've sent you a link to that. Um, so that Actually, one certainly has videos. Your Charming 2.0 bits have have a video also. I don't know how much you want to cover the layers today. No, I mean, I think we talked a lot about layers, but I do want to highlight something, actually, that I've watched recently. Um, I don't know who this person is. I wish I knew their name. But whoever the GitHub user NS950 is uh, November Sierra 950 has been an absolute rock star at contributing to our docs, which is 
really much appreciative. So I don't know if they're on IRC or whatever, but whoever you are, stranger in our community, I thank you so much for your not only opening issues on the docs, but creating a large influx of pull requests that have had our docs team on our toes reviewing and landing. Um, but it's been great changes that help make it a much easier to consume user experience. So thank you so much, November Sierra 950. I have a question specifically within U2.0. Uh, so usually before you had controllers and in Juju, before when you would now you switch to different models with Juju Switch. Before that, like in the 125, you would do Juju Switch to your environments. Specifically, if I had an AWS environment or a Rackspace environment in my environments.yaml file, I would type on the command line Juju Switch local and that would go from like my AWS to my local environment. Or if I want to go back to my AWS environment, I'd say, did you switch AWS? And that would change me from my local back to my AWS environment. So I guess that command also now, that command is now for changing to models, which seems like the appropriate thing to do because you could have, you know, models within there. But if you're bootstrapping now, what, what I guess what you guys recommend is the right way to be able to switch to different environments that you have specified in your environments.yaml. That's a cool question. So uh, a key thing to note, first of all, is that environments.yaml, as we know it, goes away with, if not the release coming up next, the following release. So mm -hmm. environments.yaml is the old way that you map my credentials to this cloud provider and you give it a name. So you're like, ah, I need to have a cloud running in GCE's US Central 1 and their other data center. You have to have two environment stanzas that have the same credentials the same configuration, just a different region name. Uh, so one of the biggest pieces of feedback that we got, and one thing that the core team has done a really good job of, is how do we make that a, an easier experience? The idea that I've got credentials, and then I've got clouds, which have a certain configuration, and the combination of the two give me something. So in the next release or two, we'll see the bootstrap command change, uh, if not completely go away, the idea where you say, I want to create a controller, and that controller is going to be this cloud, let's say GCE, in this region using these credentials. So instead of Juju tracking the combination in environments YAML, they'll simply be saying, Juju, here's my credentials for this type of cloud, and then I want to create a controller in this cloud in this region uh, with these set of credentials. Whenever you do that, you'll get a controller, but also that controller will also have a default model on it. So you're never switching between controllers, you're always switching between, between models. models. It's just some of those models will be the default model that comes as a part of that controller. Mm -hmm. And I think that list controller will probably make it pretty apparent that this is like a default model. It's probably going to be named the same as the, the controller you called it. So you'll be able to see, ah, this is just a controller model, uh, that administrative model that I can do things like deploy the GUI in that I can give access to anyone to or maybe some other things like managing share, man, managing user access like yep. the LDAP configuration or something like that, all kind of go in that administrative model, then everything else becomes separate models on that controller um, around it. So switch will always be switching environments. Wow. In this case, now environments are really models, different uh, different architectures and topologies. Yeah. In my environments, yeah, well, my, I, I would almost argue environments were almost different controllers I had, that I might have a GCE and an AWS type of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think in the release notes that I've seen is the ability to be able to manage config for your clouds currently shifting away from environment.yaml. So the no. for two, do we still use environments.yaml? No. Yes. Sort of. Yeah, I had I had to mangle dot local yeah. share juju. Environments.yaml is yeah. present in this release, but will not be in the next releases. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That was my main question as far as today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For now, right. yeah. Environments.yaml is still there. It's the same format it was previously. Uh, but that's just a description of the controller, and then the models come later. In the next release or the release after, the next either beta 1 or beta 2 of Juju, we'll see the new way to create controllers, which will be a much cleaner experience where you have a list of clouds and how those clouds map to API calls. So, for instance, there's a bunch of public clouds right now that are all OpenStack compatible APIs. You'll say, you know, Rackspace is, the back end is OpenStack. Um, DreamHost, the back end is OpenStack. Uh, 
And so that will list the configuration for those clouds as a, as a configuration file, and then you'll have a list of credentials. Here's my credentials for Rackspace. Here's a list of my credentials and users for GCE. So when you create a controller, you just say, I want to create a controller on this cloud with this credential user, and then you'll get a controller. So you no longer you no longer have to keep a giant environments.yaml. You'll just keep a separate list of the cloud configurations you have and the credentials that map to those. Okay. And they can be updated independently of each other and independent of Juju. Okay. So when we start adding new providers, they'll come in as configuration file updates rather than as entire releases of Juju. Right. Now remember for this release though, environments yaml moved away from dot juju slash environments yaml to dot local slash share slash juju environments yaml. So that's the file that you'll mangle only for this release of juju while we still have the old way. And then eventually you'll just say update clouds. All the clouds are available. Right now if we want to add a new cloud, we've got to release a whole version of juju. It's, it's horrible. So that whole going into a file to mangle your creds, that all goes away, which is really awesome. So but as of, as of today, right now, you still got a mangle. So that was dot juju Close. dot local. No, dot local, dot local which dot is, local slash share. yeah, slash that's, that's the XDG standard. Usually, files will st stick stuff in dot. So back when you learned Unix, Antonio, every, every tool put something in dot and then tool name. So you had dot yeah. blah, dot blah. Now that stuff's under dot local, oh. right? And then that way they, they split... Uh, config from data, so you can actually copy files around. So it's actually yeah. really, really yeah. awesome. And is that so. .local .share .juju? I'm sorry, .local no. .share .juju under models. It's where the environment YAML should go. No, just .local slash .share slash .juju slash environments .yaml. Yep. Okay. Just move the Juju home directory. Just type yeah, yep. or just blow it away and type retype .juju in it. Yep. I'm, well, I was going to try to copy my current environment YAML over. Oh to yes. yes .local absolutely. .share Do .juju. Just run a juju init and then copy the environments YAML over because there's a bunch of other configuration files that get created during the init process now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's the XDG directory specification If for those of you interested in checking that out. And the same applies for the OSX and um, Windows releases as well. While it's not home slash dot local slash share, et cetera, it's in the application data directories right. that map to those operating systems. And if you get the error on the name, the model must be specified. Did you work through that one? Yeah, you. so from now on, anytime you give it a command, so in the old day, you used to say destroy environment, which is, you know, a long time ago. Now, now anytime you do everything, you almost always have to specify the model that you want to do stuff to. Okay, cool. That's good to know if folks are, if folks are trying the... We're trying to help it too as far as how you get it bootstrapped. And make sure yeah. you copy over your environment channel file and make sure to unbootstrap you right. with the model name. And for the alpha, you always have to dash dash upload dash tools. That's that's just a workaround for this release. In the future you won't have to do that. But if you're if you're on Zenial and doing all the happiness right now, you gotta dash dash upload tools. Um, as you can see, every once in a while, like that container didn't fire up. Every once in a while you get you get a few bugs like that, but generally speaking, at two point with LaxD and Xenial and ZFS and stuff is generally so much better than I'm willing willing to put up with the occasional. And if you do have problems uh, with machines provisioning, you can always type juju retry provisioning and the machine number. To yeah. Kind of what, one thing that happened, I realized, is I did the speed trick that turned off app get update, app get upgrade. But in trusty containers, like it went to fire it up and it got stuck, and I was, huh, I wonder why. So I did Lexi exec the name of the container, bin bash, it went in there and it found out it was just stuck on an update because the deb it was expecting was not living in the archive anymore because I didn't do an upgrade, update and upgrade. So I purposely kind of shut that off for speed reasons. But the cloud image I have was in that two-week window where it wasn't updated. So I kind of burned myself on that. Um, but, hey, I mean, I took the brakes off and every once in a while that'll just happen. So I just finished the upgrade, exited it out, do do kept on going and things started deploying. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, the only people who are really going to run into that stuff are, are in this Hangout. Uh, so if, if you st stick to the stable over the next few months, we'll, we'll have all these kind of little nitnoid things sorted out for you, like 
the GUI not deploying, which I will investigate immediately after this meeting. Cool. Um, we got about 10 minutes. Does anyone have any questions in the... Yeah, any, yeah any questions? I haven't seen any pop up so far, but there have been some gentle reminders from people, so thank you for reminding us on how things... Yeah, just to give people a quick quick status on where we're going in the new year, we're already planning on uh, the next Juju Charmer Summit, going to target somewhere around mid-September. We don't want to do it in October because we run into OpenStack and um, there's a lot of overlap there. We want to make sure that we have OpenStack expertise available to our users doing the summit. Um, and we're I'm currently looking at hitting as many of the DevOps days around the country as we can, including the one in Amsterdam. So uh, pay attention to the list. We'll be announcing where we're going to be speaking at uh, over the next year. So DevOps Days, we, we just went to one in LA a few weeks ago as part of Scale, and it was overwhelmingly awesome. Like We learned so much from guys like Ticketmaster that are running things at Scale and, and just all sorts of large organizations that are really experts at running these high-end complex systems, and we're really looking forward to showing how we can help people with that. So that's we're going to look at hitting those DevOps days. Uh, and, of course, we're obviously going to be back at Config Management Camp uh, next year because that was, just, that was just an awesome event. It was, it was really good to join um, Puppet, Chef, uh, the guys from Salt. Every, everybody was there. It was just a lot of fun. Um, so I highly recommend you come next year if you didn't come this year. Uh, so with that, we looks like we don't really have any questions. Do we have any? I do have a final comment. Okay. So so why don't you close this off? Well, I just want to I just want to comment on the GUI thing. So I was so sad it didn't work. It's usually worked so well. Mm -hmm. The the GUI guys already know about it and they've already landed a bunch of fixes for it. So the next GUI release will be updated. But okay. the APIs for logging into the Juju GUI, the facades, some of the endpoints change, which cause a breakage. Which okay. is why we're going to 2.0, where some backwards compatibility breaks will happen. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that's I just wanted to mention the GUI thing. Oh, okay. Like, cool. The GUI guys are usually on it. Like they, their stuff's always so crisp. This is just a, a weird flux. So the next release of the GUI that should be. Well, that's why we put alpha in front of everything that you see in the status. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's it's those of you listening. It's not your job to fix this stuff. This is what we're doing every day to make sure that by April you get something nice and tight. So, with that, this will conclude this office hours. However, I do not want to leave without scheduling the next one because Antonio's like, hey man, do you schedule next office hours? And I was like, no. So uh, you guys want to pick a day? What do we want to do here? Let's Fourth look at the April. calendar. Fourth of April? Wow, you already is that is that too far? That's over Well that two months away. No, it's not. That's that's three weeks. April is well March is what we're looking for. Oh sorry, yeah. March. What, whatever. The next month. Yeah. Would folks be a proponent of just having it at a regular time and day, like the first well, Friday we, or Tuesday? We, we tried day. doing that. The problem is with people's conference schedules and things like that, it, uh, it ended up being we would schedule them all, and then people hated that we went back and just canceled them all. So I think what we're going to do is schedule never end office hours without scheduling the next one. That way, like today, we'll nail it, and then I'll announce it today, and everyone's all set and go. But that gives us the flexibility if someone has to go to a conference or something like that, or you know, someone's on vacation or holidays or things like that. So uh, I vote March fourth is the week after MWC. March fourth it is. Let me let me take that down. Office hours, and I'll go ahead and announce that. Next time. As always, if you like this Office Hours, please subscribe to the channel, the YouTube channel. If you like it, click like. If you hated it, click dislike. Don't worry. Our livelihood doesn't depend on likes and dislikes, but I don't know. It's just really nice to know when we're providing content that people like. And if not, we'll see everybody else in two weeks. And I don't know. Have a great day, everybody. Cool. Thanks for sharing, right. George. See you both.